Hi, thanks for joining us on another episode of Space Nuts. My name is Andrew Dunkley, your host. Hope you're well. Coming up this week, uh, we are going to look at uh, a potential plan to catch the space doogie. Yes, they're going to get down and dirty and try and chase this thing down. This was a, a an exo asteroid uh, known as Oumuamua that uh, passed through our uh, solar system a few years ago now. Um, There's been talk about trying to catch it. Well, now they think they've got a plan. We're also going to look at planet formation. It looks like planets uh, form in different ways than we thought. Uh, We'll discuss that. Get your M&Ms ready. That's all coming up on this episode of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining me, as always, to talk about all of those things and probably a lot more because that's what happens sometimes is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. Um, Good to talk to you. I understand my audio is not brilliant at the moment, but um, maybe we can work around that. Well, just press on regardless. I'll do the radio thing and just pretend nothing's wrong. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, we, we yeah. are having some technical issues. We seem to swap. One week it's me, yeah. next week it's yeah. you. One day, one day we will both have a seamless presentation. No, no. <laughs> but not today. Not today. No. <laughs> okay, let's let's get straight down to business because uh, this is a rather exciting story and it carries on from a, a story we did a few years ago when it was realised that an exo-asteroid past the planet, passed through our solar system. In fact, it was past us before we discovered it. And uh, there's been all sorts of theories as to what it is, one theory being that it was uh, the remnants of an alien spaceship uh, and others saying it's probably the sheared off section of a planet. Uh, Whatever it was, it did not come from our solar system. It came from somewhere else. But now there's talk of maybe uh, putting a mission together to catch it. Now, I I thought when we talked about this once before, Fred, it was thought impossible, but now they've done the maths, maths with an S for you Americans. What's the the story? Um, It it is. So uh, I think this is a refinement, actually, of something that was proposed almost immediately after the uh, the, 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 the mission, sorry, the, the... the object flew through the solar system. Oumuamua, first first messenger from afar, a Hawaiian word, uh, because it was discovered, I think, by Pan Stars upon uh, Haleakala on the island of Maui. Um, so uh, it was found in, I think it was October 2017, realized that its velocity was too high for it to have been anything to do with the solar system. Uh, it was already sort of passed its closest approach to the sun by the time it was discovered and zoomed off into the wide blue yonder at something like, I don't know, it's this, yeah, I can't remember the speed. It's 30 or 40 kilometers per second. It's very fast. So um, Mm. that prompted a number of, uh, uh, a number of uh, speculations about what it was. Uh, And the, the, the most, you know, the most um, rigorous, uh, detail we have of it is that it's an odd shape because it's light curve. As it tumbled around, its light curve went up and down. It was at first thought to be a cigar uh, or a bread stick or whatever you thought it might have been, Andrew, without going into any detail. <laughs> something uh, something shaped like that. Yes, that's right. Uh, uh, but later work suggested that a better fit came from something in the shape of a pancake uh, tumbling mm. end over end. Uh, and that led to the fact that it's red in colour uh, which is what you get if you put something in deep space for a long time because the cosmic rays bake it to a sort of reddish color. Uh, and so, and that, that fits the bill because it was expected this might have been trolling through space for, you know, several million years since it left its parent system, wherever that is. Anyway, uh, one other person uh, um, uh, of, um, of, of note, uh, um, Claimed it might be an, an interstellar spacecraft. Uh, and, Arby uh, Loeb. <laughs> Arby Loeb, that's right. And, um, you know, looked at, looked and, and drew uh, for, in support of that, the fact that it was behaving not like an asteroid. Asteroids are solid lumps of rock or something that don't 
they don't out gas no no gas comes from them so they they behave entirely under gravitational rules um you know the the, the newtonian gravity uh Newtonian physics actually predicts where they're going to go and where they where they've been, uh, and that's no problem. But this wasn't behaving like this, uh, and the suggestion was that something was outgassing, giving a kind of jet thrust, um, and which is what comets do. We, comets behave like that when they outgas yeah. the other sun. Asteroids don't. So what was it? Is it something in between these? Uh, we'd just love to see it up close and get a spectrometer on it. And so, again, within a few weeks of that first apparition, a plan was put in place, an orbital plan that would allow us to chase it. reason why it's in the news again is that that orbital plan has been tightened up and um, has now been demonstrated to be feasible with existing technology. Uh, and Ooh. I think it involves uh, SpaceX's Starship. Uh, so, you, you know, you get the biggest, best rocket you can, and you go through a succession of really clever um, gravity assists, uh, which are kind of, kind of counterintuitive. Uh, and I should just say that it is uh, it is a project that has long been called Project Lyra, um, and it's actually one of the proponents of Project Lyra, uh, uh, who has put a blog out this week, this is why it's in the news, uh, to say uh, that you could do it with uh, SpaceX Falcon Heavy uh, and NASA's Space Launch System. Both of them would be accept uh, would be acceptable to send a probe towards Jupiter. And then what you do is you do a very, very clever gravity assist at Jupiter in which you strip all the orbital velocity off your probe so it falls directly back towards the sun. And then uh, this, you know, you're going the wrong way here. You think, what's what's mm. happening? It's going the wrong way. Oumuamua's out there. But it turns out if Jupiter's in the right place and the uh, calculations show that it is, you drop the spacecraft back to the sun and do something called an Oberth maneuver, which means bringing it very, very close to the sun so that it gets a huge gravity assist and that propels it out towards Oumuamua at a velocity of about 57 kilometers per second, which is enough to catch it up in ah. 2057. When? 2057. That's when it catches up, yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> disappointing. Well... It is, but um, at least it catches up. Uh, you know, we, as you said, we all thought, "Oh, yeah, it's, it's long gone. This is hopeless. Not nothing's going to mm. happen here." Uh, but Project Lyra seems to have wings, or legs, or whatever the term is, <laughs> or exhaust plumes in, in the space world. Um, so, yeah, possible, possibly, uh, possibly worth uh, thinking about. Uh, I, I should say this is written up uh, in a lovely article, which is on. Uh, an Australian science website that we don't often mention, but they're very, very good. I've written for them a long, long time ago. Uh, it's called Cosmos. Uh, Cosmos has a an article called We Have a Plan to Chase Down Our First Known Interstellar Visitor. And it quotes um, somebody who's a, an old friend, uh, Associate Professor Alice Gorman, who's uh, at Flinders University. And she's a space archaeologist. That's her job. Um, she's a really interesting character to talk to. Mm. So, uh, w w any word on where, when this project might be launched, uh, if they go ahead with it? So, you, you, presumably, you have a fairly tight window, and I did see the date, but I've forgotten what it was. Um, I think it's towards the end of this decade that you've got to do it. So, you kind of got to wait for uh, for Jupiter to be in the right the right place. Um, I, I think you... I've found it. Um, let's uh, June the seventh, twenty thirty. There you go. End of the decade. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. So you launch it on June the seventh, twenty thirty. It's going to take you that long to raise the money to do this, uh, and um, and then by twenty fifty seven, you have a rendezvous with Oumuamua, and we get to see what it was like. Yeah. How old will you be and in twenty fifty seven, Andrew? I don't want to think about it. Um, old will I it'll be? be a big number. It'll be a big yeah. number. Yeah. Um, but it's Okay, big, let's say... I'll, we... I'll only be 113, so <laughs> it's not that big. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll be pushing 100 in that case. Um, 
let's assume we catch it. What do you think we will discover? What, what, what do you think we might learn? We might as well speculate because we're not going to be around to find yeah, out. That's right. Um, I think we'll find, I think you'll find, I think uh, it will turn out to be something similar to uh, what we used to call Ultima Thule, that object that New Horizons flew past after uh, Pluto. Um, Arakoth, I think, is its accepted name today. I think it's Arakoth, uh, which, if you remember, was two pancakes stuck together. Um, yes. Uh, so that we thought it looked like a snowman, but it's only a snowman if you look at it from one direction. It's quite thin if you look at it from the other direction. And I think it'll look like that, maybe just one of those pancakes. Okay. Uh, will it give us any indications of whether or not things are different beyond our solar system, or are we expecting that there'll be a standard model? No, no. I, th I think um, it will, yes, it will reveal the nuances of what makes solar systems individuals, if I can put it that way. Um, because, uh, they, you know, I don't know whether there will be any thought of going into orbit around it. That would be fantastic if you could do that. But I suspect that the, the closing velocity, like in the case of New Horizons, uh, it was going too fast to ever think about slowing it down to go into orbit around Pluto. In fact, I think it passed it at if I remember rightly, something like 13 or 14 kilometers per second. It was a very high-speed flyby. Uh, but in mm. that time, if you're careful with your preparation, as, as the New Horizons team definitely were, because they absolutely reaped a harvest of, of data from Pluto, uh, if you're careful like that, um, you can gain a huge amount of information. Spectroscopically, uh, you could have you know all the, all the mass spectrometers and things on your spacecraft that would sample the environment of Oumuamua, because if it's been out gassing, it's probably got kind of atoms around it and things like that, that, uh, you know, that, that, that um, uh, subatomic particles that, that give some insights into what it's made of in, the, in detail. So yeah, it would be worth doing. I'd be up. Yeah. <laughs> what about what about the other one? Because this this isn't the only exo asteroid that we've discovered. Uh, what was the other one? Borisov. Borisov. Yeah, and that uh, was definitely a comet. Why not chase a comet? Was it? Yeah. So uh, that was that was a, a kind of standard comet that behaved very much in the way that um, comets behave in our solar system. There were, I think, some slight differences, but uh, but it it, it yeah. I mean, you know we're, we're remembering stuff from our coverage back then. But yeah, it's um, it's a it's that was a comet, and that was definitely a comet. It behaved just like comets do. Okay, so it so so it was just one from within our solar system, or no, it was no. an exo comet. It, it was an exo. So an, we've got an exo comet and an exo asteroid. So the asteroid is right. more interest mm. <clears throat> because it behaves. It's got certain aspects of its behavior which are more comet-like than asteroid-like. But everything about it said it was an asteroid. <laughs> yeah. Except okay. for the fact that it's out, it's, something's accelerating it. That's and that's of course why Avi Loeb leapt on the on the yeah. uh, intelligent life bandwagon because maybe someone was controlling yeah. it. <clears throat> well, you know, it, it it could be something from an intelligent civilization. It, it's probably them getting rid of uh, all the <laughs> the plastics that were destroying their yeah. planet. Could be that. Do plastics go red if you put them in space for a million years? Probably. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Well, I, I hope they do get this particular mission off the ground. Uh, when you're talking about the speeds, where it, it uh, so the mission will travel after its slingshot almost double the speed of Mua Mua. Is that mm. what we're thinking? I think it's something okay. like that. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah, they're hurtling along, aren't they? Those are incredible speeds. And to get to those speeds, you need this curious um, maneuver that sends you past the sun. Uh, and one of the things that this article, one of the points it makes is that uh, that's actually, it's distance from the sun when that maneuver takes place is less than the Parker Solar Probe. I beg your pardon, more than the Parker Solar Probe has experienced. Oh. So the Parker Solar Probe, which is shielded uh, to protect it from the sun's radiation, has already survived being uh, at less than that distance from the sun. So that's a yeah. good sign as well. It is a good sign. Yes, all right. Well, we'll watch with interest. We've got a few years up our sleeve. They've got um, they've got six years to get this all funded and uh, get the, the hardware ready. So, um, yeah, it could well happen. Six years, I guess, is not really a long time in planning a space mission, but 
Um, yeah, they haven't got they haven't got any more time than that. So let's, no, let's hope right. it's uh, right. yeah, let's hope it's, it's a success uh, in the planning. And if you want to read about that, you can go to cosmosmagazine.com. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Let's take a break from the show now to tell you about our sponsor, Incogni. Uh, now, uh, I don't know if you've heard of a data broker, but, um, you know, the internet's a great invention, no doubt about that. But there's certainly a dark side to it. There's even a dark web version of the internet. Uh, and uh, data brokers are people who collect and analyze and sell your personal information to third parties uh, or use it themselves for profit often without uh, your consent. In fact, most of the time without your consent. Uh, so data brokers are very, very active and they're, um, you know, they're out there and they're collecting data. They can build profiles based on you for their own devices and uh, a lot of the time you just never know it's happening. Uh, occasionally you might get a friend saying, hey, did you know that there's this um, Facebook page and it's, it says it's you and they've made a friend request? That happens a lot. Uh, data broking is big business. Uh, and uh, you, you, chances are you already have had your personal information sold online to these uh, individuals. So what can you do about it? Well, if you tried to do it yourself, uh, yeah, you probably could, but it might take you a couple of years to clean up what's out there about you. Uh, Incogni is a tool that can do it on your behalf. You just have to sign up and uh, give them permission and they will go around the internet and not only clean up your act on your behalf, they will also put up a, uh, a wall to stop this happening in future. Uh, it's a great tool. It's uh, really easy to use and it's not expensive. In fact, right now, as a Space Nuts listener, they're offering uh, a really great deal and all you have to do is go to incogni.com slash space nuts. That's incogni.com slash space nuts. And uh, have a look at what's on offer. Um, I might add that uh, at the moment they've got a 60% discount, uh, which will limit um, public access to your private information. Uh, it'll uh, certainly uh, mitigate any chance of uh, identity theft and it will keep your data from being sold incogni.com slash space nuts go and have a look and uh, choose the subscription that suits you there are annual plans and monthly plans and a 30-day money back guarantee that's incogni.com slash space nuts uh, go and check it out and get the deal now back to the show Three, two, one. Space nuts. Okay, Fred, let's turn our attention to planet formation. And you and I have talked about how planets um, basically form from, um, you know, disks of, uh, of debris that um, sort of come together, um, accretion, uh, all that sort of stuff. And then they sort of glob together under their own gravity and become a mass. Uh, and we always just assumed, I suppose, that it, it turns into a sphere by default, but now they're starting to think, hang on, we're missing a piece of this puzzle. It's not quite like that. And the early the early planets, the, the, the infant planets, if you like, are not spherical at all. Indeed, that's right. Um, possibly. <laughs> possibly, possibly, yeah. yes. Always got to say that when we're talking yeah. astronomy and space science theory, possibly. Um, and it's because there are, there are actually, you know, we kind of, in in our simplistic world way here at Space Nuts, we do simplify some of the details, um, and um, there are that's actually for my, that's for my personal benefit, of course. Uh, uh, it's mine as well, Andrew, <laughs> <laughs> because um, a lot of these are fields of astronomy that that I'm not an expert in. I've worked in many fields of astronomy, but not everything. But I do have a, you know, fairly good overview of what's going on. But, um, the, but so there are two, basically two uh, theories or two possible methods by which we think planets are formed. Uh, one is called core accretion. Uh, so core, C-O-R-E, uh, accretion is stuff coming together. And uh, I'm actually quoting here from one of the authors of the paper that we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, he's uh, his name is Adam Fenton. Um, 
let me, in fact, I'll, I'll read what he said because that's the easiest way to do it. Uh, many exoplanets, mm -hmm. which are planets that orbit stars in other solar systems outside of our own, have been discovered in the last three decades. It's about more than 5,000 now. Uh, despite observing many thousands of them, how they form remains unexplained. It is believed that they either form through core accretion, which is a gradual growth of dust particles that stick together to form progressively larger and larger objects on long time scales, or directly by the breaking up of large rotating protostellar disks around young stars in short timescales, which is what we call the theory of disk instability. Um, now, I've kind of read about both of these, and uh, but I, uh, you know, I was uh, interested to hear that there's there's still two competing theories. Uh, so um, uh, Adam goes on to say the theory. This theory is appealing due to the fact that large planets can form very quickly at large distances from their host star, explaining some exoplanet observations. And so what they've done is they've run models of this second model, this disk instability model. Uh, so just to recap, what you've got is a, a, a rotating disk of debris, uh, dust and gas around a, a new star. And we know they exist because we can see them. We've got many images from the ALMA spacecraft, uh, sorry, the ALMA telescope in particular up there in the uh, in the northern uh, and the northern Atacama Desert in Chile, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. Uh, so uh, we we know these things exist. Uh, and so, just recapping the disk instability method, you've got a disk of stuff in which you get swirls, and those swirls are what then form the planets, rather than you know just it just being like an empty space with bits of dust coming to stick together, uh, gradually building up planetesimals and uh, protoplanets. I mean, planet, planetesimals and protoplanets might be involved in the disk instability model, but the main point about it, as Adam says, is it's very much quicker. Um, you know, you're talking about a few million years rather than hundreds of millions of years. And what they've done, so they this, uh, this science has been done from actually the University of Central Lancashire's Jeremiah Horrocks Institute for Mathematics, Physics, and Astronomy. Uh, I used to work very closely with uh, those people in University of Central Lancashire. Uh, should get in touch with them again and see how they're doing because this is great work. Mm -hmm. um, but what they've done is they've uh, done uh, simulations. Uh, if you got you know, want to work out a theory as to what's happening, they've done some simulations of this disk instability uh, way of forming planets. Uh, they've run actually half a million hours of central processing unit time um, on uh, a high-performance computer computing facility in the UK. Uh, and they've produced some very, very spectacular imagery of what uh, a protoplanetary disk forming planets might look like. And what it does is it uh, generates models of planets which turn out to be oblate spheroids. What's an oblate spheroid? It's an M&M. &M. Uh, it's yeah. something very flattened. Uh, so, or a uh, smarty. Some yes, or a smarty. smarty. It depends on what. Don't eat the red ones. <laughs> Why don't you eat the red one? They, they banned the red smarties. Apparently so, they had a food colouring in them that uh, was um, considered to be um, carcinogenic. I didn't know. True. Look it up. Yeah. I will. I will look it up. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yes. So um, well, I I I mentioned M and M's for our transatlantic, sorry, trans Pacific listeners. Uh, but yes, Marty's uh, much the same, aren't they? Really? <laughs> oh, I, I used to devour those things by the thousand as a kid. Yeah. Could explain a lot now. <laughs> <laughs> Smarties have played a part in my history too, Andrew, um, because the very first telescope I ever made used a Smarties tube to start with and with a lens at either end. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't a very big one, but it worked. It actually worked. Uh, wow. <laughs> no, it's about, about nine at the time, I think. Finished the Smarties and made the tube into All right. a telescope. Terrible dad joke. Aren't you a Smarty? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not now, but perhaps I was there. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, but uh, interesting stuff. So that's a surprise because... Um, People have thought, you know, we we would just generate spherical planets, and eventually, when we start getting um, 
huge telescopes like the ELT, and we can actually look at these protoplanets directly, we might need to know what shape they are. Uh, and in fact, to, to some extent, that's true even now with um, observa some of the observations that are made, for example, by the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, it would be very helpful to know if the inference that you're making, that there is a planet in orbit around this star, is uh, smarty shaped rather than rather than spherical, because it, it would actually change the modeling of you know the way the light reflects off the surface of the planet. So it's important work, and um, mm. very nice to see it coming out of the University of Central Lancashire. Are they suggesting, though, that this could apply to all planet formation, or do the, the, is this a circumstantial thing? Um, it, dep it depends, you know, w what turns out to be the, the most um, important method or the most, uh, how can I put it, uh, basically what method has given rise to most planets that's and by method i mean either core accretion or disk instability these two different models of how planets form um, uh, eventually we're going to be able to distinguish between the two uh, there are going to be parameters that might be measurable that would distinguish between them and in fact the flattening or a uh, a blatantness of a planet, how squashed it is, might be one of them. And by that, I mean a young planet, because it's likely that the what's called the differentiation process, which is actually what makes planets spherical, that might take over uh, as the planet, you know, becomes uh, big enough for gravity to pull it into a spherical shape. So uh, it's mm -hmm. it's speculative. I mean, I'm speculating here, but I think the inference is that these newly born planets are are flattened rather than all planets being flattened uh, so that it's only a short period in its early history that, that a planet will actually be um, rather like a, a smarty rather than a, rather than a, um, well, uh, a different sort of chocolate, a Malteser, let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, a Malteser, a Jaffa. Or a Jaffa cake. Uh, are they Jaffas? Yeah, Jaffas, that's right. Not Jaffas, Jaffas yes, Jaffas. yes. That's, that's, another, that's another one of my childhood sweets that um, uh, a lot of people didn't eat because they became projectiles at cinemas. It was a thing. <laughs> yes, it would be. Throwing, throwing Jaffas at the screen because they made a beautiful crack when they hit it. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, we were so naughty back then. Yep. Yeah. I, I never did it, of course. Of never. course you wouldn't have done. You, you would have been... Perfectly well behaved, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I've never been kicked out of a cinema, so it says two things. I was good or I never got caught. Yes, I think that's right. Um, mm. It might be the latter there, but that's the kind of speculation on my part. <laughs> uh, do, do, they, do they know how our planet was formed? Has that been sorted out, or is, is it possible what we were once a smarty? Yeah, I think so, um, because... Oh. I don't think it's ruled out that the solar system, uh, that the solar system formed by disk instability, um, and it, you know, we may find that 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 um, phenomenon that of planet formation might turn out to be the one that was dominant. In which case, maybe yes, the Earth was flattened. I mean, the Earth is 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 slightly flattened to this day. Uh, I can't remember the exact dimensions, uh, but the distance from pole to pole is is smaller than the distance across the equator. Uh, so it's it's an oblate spheroid is the technical term for what its shape is. And the, and the most pronounced one in the solar system is, is Saturn, which is quite obviously not circular when you see it's when you see an image of it. It's obviously flattened. Mm. Okay. And um, but that's not because of formation, that's what it's like now. Yeah, that's right. That's what it's like now. And but maybe it never, never really, you know, because of its spin, it rotates very quickly. Is it ten hours or thereabouts? Uh, the, and it's a big object. Uh, that's the mechanism by which it is remaining flat. But if it was formed by disk instability, maybe it started off even more flattened, uh, as maybe the Earth did too, and gradually got yeah. spherical as the differentiation process took place. Well, I mean, you could argue that uh, the Earth isn't spherical because of its rotation. Um, yeah, it's, that's right. It's it's wider than it is high, isn't it? Yes, yes. That's what I was just saying. The distance between the uh, poles is uh, less than the distance across the equator. Maybe yeah, by... 40, 40, 43 kilometres, actually. I just yeah. looked it up. 
which is not much in the scheme of things when you think about it. I mean, no, that's right. It's twelve and a half thousand kilometers across. The the most remarkable object in the solar system in that regard is actually the sun, uh, which is flattened. You know, it's one point three million million kilometers in diameter. Its flattening at the poles is only ten kilometers. Mm. Uh, which means it is almost perfectly spherical. It's a very, very, very um, spherical object. Yeah. Almost perfectly yeah. spherical. Which, you know, given its size, is quite incredible. But maybe that's a factor. Maybe the size and the you know, and the gravity involved is uh, is what keeps it that way. Yeah, and it's slow rotation. Twenty twenty seven days to rotate it once. Yeah, that's indeed. Cool. Mm. All right. Uh, fascinating story about flat planet formation, which you can read on phys.org. That's P-H-Y-S, not F-I-double-Z. A few people have been caught out by that. This is Space Nuts, Andrew Dunkley uh, with Fred Watson. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Production note. Wondering where the Q&A segment is? Never fear. It now has its own podcast called, funnily enough, Space Nuts Q&A, and it will be in your feed on Mondays. No need to do anything. It will turn up just like Space Nuts does on Thursdays, so you'll now get Space Nuts twice a week. But if you can't wait, you may like to consider becoming a patron and getting the whole show in one hit. Your choice. Details on how to become a patron on our websites at spacenuts.io or bytes.com. We hope you enjoy this new format. Thank you.